we emergency providers, we get thrust into the front lines like all the time, right? We see blood and gore and pain and extreme emotions almost on a daily basis. Emergency medicine seems to attract the kind of people who can endure repeated incredible successes followed by, inc by repeated incredible disasters and catastrophes over and over and over. We have that sort of bravery and fortitude to do that. You know, you ask, I ask myself, how do we leave the resuscitation rooms like this and the bereavement rooms without a sense of humanity as this totally warped thing? Well, it's because we have this innate ability to compartmentalize and depersonalize repeated traumatic events. This happens in famines and wars all the time. So when we compartmentalize and depersonalize, it allows us to get on with that pediatric airway or that PEA arrest or what have you. Now, it ensures that we get the job done, that we do it step by step, that we perform as experts like we are in emergency medicine. But the problem is that when we depersonalize like this, even though it's very adaptive, it's actually not very good for compassion, as you can imagine. Sometimes, when we have that person in front of us on the stretcher, we don't do what's right for that person. That person in front of us is more than just the sum of their anatomy and physiology. That person in front of us is more than just a diagnostic puzzle. So I wasn't surprised when I started learning more and more about this topic that we suck at compassion. Not only do we suck, but it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse every year. Why? Well, it's trained out of us. There's studies that show from the beginning of medical school until the end of medical school, compassionate care decreases. Our ability to be compassionate decreases. And it's in the language that we use. Who here remembers the term Gomer? Yeah, holy smokes, like half the audience just put their hand up. Gomer, can you believe we actually use that term? Get out of my emergency room? I mean, just think about how compassionless that is. And just like uh, Peter Brindley was saying, space repetition here, I still hear all the time, hey, that appendicitis in bed nine hasn't been seen by surgery yet. That's a person in that room. That person has a name. That person's not just a diagnosis or a number, right? So it's trained out of us, and it's in the language that we use. And then I had to ask myself, well, how much time do we spend actually being compassionate at work? Well, to answer that question, I need to answer the question, how much time do we spend at the bedside? So what do we think? We spend 20% of our, our clinical time, of our work time at the bedside, 30%, 40%. Well, it turns out we spend 12% of our time at work. Physicians spend 12% of their time at work at the bedside. That's it. 12%. Now, how much of that 12% of the time at the bedside do we spend being compassionate? 1% of that 12%. So one one thousandth of our time at work we spend being compassionate. One one thousandth. We miss emotional cues to be compassionate all the time. Patients give us these emotional cues and we routinely miss them. I invited a friend and a colleague to to a course in 2019. And uh, I'm just gonna play this video, you've seen this before, or this audio rather. Um, and uh, I just want you to listen to the message that she gives you. I was helping out with EM cases since I was a resident at McMaster through my emergency residency at Queens, through my 
fellowship in emergency ultrasound at Western University, my first year of practice when I became staff at London, and through this past year when I haven't been working. Last June, when I was getting ready to come as part of your Toronto group, um, I was going to be working at University Health Network. Instead of walking through the doors of Toronto Western Hospital as a physician, I walked through as a patient. Last June, I had a bump growing on my head, and what I thought was a cyst was a five centimeter tumor in my skull that was pushing on my brain. I had a sarcoma that nobody could identify, and nobody really knows what it is. I'm metastatic, and I'm now palliative. Over the last year, I've gone through a lot, and this just puts the context to my answer of Anton's question. Today, I'm not going to talk to you about the chemotherapy that coursed through my veins last summer and left me in bed, and I'm not going to talk to you about the radiation that penetrated my skull for six weeks on a daily basis. I'm not going to talk to you about the skull that was removed in October and the rotational flap that left me in the ICU for a week. I'm not going to talk to you about when that became necrotic and opened and failed. I'm not going to talk to you about the flap that came from my arm and had to cover that area. I'm not going to talk to you about the infection that was on my titanium plate and made the wound not healing. I'm not going to talk to you about how it opened six times before they decided that the titanium plate was infected and removed it so that now I walk around without a skull. I'm not going to talk to you about when I became metastatic in February. I'm not going to talk to you about the lesions in my pelvis or my hip that made me walk with a limp and use crutches before they radiated, or the one in my sternum that was missed on two scans and made it painful to get hugs. I'm not going to talk about losing my fertility to radiation. And I'm not going to talk about the infection and abscess that was under my scalp that was only noticed two weeks ago and caused wound dehiscence. I'm not going to talk about last week when I found out that I had multiple lesions bilaterally, top to bottom, in both my lungs. What I do want to leave with you today is the power of connection and the power of education, and the power of presence. The patient-physician relationship is far more than you realize. It has an impact that lingers. I've spent more nights in the emergency department as a patient than I ever want to again. And those moments, those little moments, matter so much more than you realize. For the patient that's going through a lot, even when they don't look like they're going through a lot and they look healthy like me, it's a journey, not one that anybody really wants to be on. Those little moments that you have can change somebody's life. The moments where my physicians have had heart and I can feel their heart in my care makes all the difference. And the moments when their heart's not there also makes a difference. A good friend of mine reminded me of one of my favorite quotes today by Maya Angelou. It says, people don't remember what you say and people don't remember what you do, but they do remember how you make them feel. So today, thank you for making me feel heard. So Dr. Tatum's no longer with us, but there were three words that she said that I want you to ask yourselves when, in your patient encounters if you actually do this with all your patients. You know, do you make a true human connection with your patients? Are you actually present as a human being with all your patient encounters? And do you really educate your patients, not just that their troponin was negative and they can go home, but do you really educate them about the true nature of their illness as much as you can. 
I'm going to switch gears completely now and talk about the evidence for compassion in five spheres. So here we go. The first sphere is going to be in patient outcomes. Now, we all know it's kind of intuitive that if you're compassionate, you're going to decrease the anxiety in the patient. But some of you might be thinking, well, I don't really care too much about the anxiety of the patient. I want to know hard outcomes. So major trauma patients, huge study showed that the physicians with the highest compassion scores versus the, comp the physicians with the lowest compassion scores, four times better functional outcomes in those that had the high compassion scores. A study of major trauma patients and MI patients, faster recovery times in those patients who received compassionate care. Another study of MI patients actually showed that the patient that the patients who had the physicians who were the least compassionate had a three times higher odds of death. It's not just trauma patients and MI patients. patients there's an RCT done on migraine headaches, on back pain headaches. They showed lower pain scores, better functional outcomes, fewer days off work with, with physicians who were more compassionate. And patients like Dr. Tatum, with palliative cancer, not only does it improve the quality of life, it actually improves survival. That's the first, first sphere, just patient outcomes in general. Second sphere, procedures. So we do pr surgical procedures all the time in the eMERGE. If you say a few compassionate statements just before a surgical procedure, studies show less patient anxiety, easier sedations, improved pain scores, shorter length of stay, and decreased need for opioids. What about whether patients will actually take the medicine that you prescribe them or listen to your discharge instructions? Well, this has everything to do with the patient's trust in you. And does compassion improve the trust between the patient and the physician? And the answer, of course, is yes. So if they trust you, they're more likely to take their medications. Being compassionate protects you from getting sued. And it's not just the CMPA who clearly states that the more compassionate you are, the less likely you are to get patient complaints and litigation against you. But there was this fascinating RCT done in an emergency department waiting room. So picture this. There's 437 patients not in the waiting room at once, although that would be a lot. But 430 patients, they randomized to one of two videos. And the videos were simulated patient-physician interactions. And the videos were identical in every way except for two statements. One statement was that the physician understood that the patient was concerned about their symptoms. And number two was that they did the right thing by coming to the eMERGE. Very simple. Not especially hugely compassionate, but those two compassionate statements. They randomized them to one of these two videos. They were identical in every other way. And then afterwards, they asked them their likelihood of suing the doctor in, case, in the event that they missed a diagnosis that led to a bad outcome. And those 200 or so pay, uh, people who saw the video that just had those two little statements in it, they were significantly less likely to have thoughts of litigation. Now, I think you'd, we'd all be living under a rock if we didn't recognize that our healthcare systems are severely in debt. So anything we can do to save money and to improve efficiency and to relieve overcrowding is a good thing, right? And it turns out that compassionate physicians order fewer tests. They order fewer CT scans, lab work. They order fewer tests. There's fewer patient visits for physicians who work in, in offices who are, who are, who are uh, more compassionate. So less, less tests ordered, and there's less refer referrals made. So if you can imagine, if all of us scored really high on our compassion scores, how much that could potentially save the entire system, could relieve overcrowding, could improve efficiency even. The last sphere I want to talk about has less to do with the system and, again, more to do with you. And I think the Dalai Lama said it best. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. 
So we've all seen the compassionless physician out there who's totally burnt out, right? That's kind of intuitive, but not only does compassion protect you against burnout and make your job more satisfying, but it also decreases your risk of making medical error. So the more compassionate you are, the more likely you are to make a medical error. Sarah Fui is an incredible passionate, passionate person, by the way, so. <laughs> All right. Um, now, some of you might be thinking, well, either I'm compassionate or I'm not. It's part of my personality. I can't really do anything about it. I was just born that way. Well, that's plainly not true. The definition of compassion involves action. It's a behavior. And just like any behavior, it can be learned and it can be unlearned. So how do you do this? How do you learn compassion if you're not feeling especially compassionate? And I went through all of this because I was not a compassionate physician. I fully admit, and this is partly why I chose this topic. I've been practicing it over the years. You might be thinking, your other excuse besides, oh, this is just part of your personality or not, is that it doesn't take, it, it takes too much time. I'm in a busy emergency department. I don't have time to be compassionate. Well, they've done studies on this, and it shows, they show that it only takes 40 seconds to significantly affect patient levels of anxiety and outcomes. 40 seconds, that's it. So how do you do this? All you have to do is say some of these things. They don't have to be these things. They could be other statements. Just say them. Now, at first, it might feel a bit contrived. It might feel disingenuous. It might not feel like you're being compassionate when you say them. But as you say them more and more and more, there's this positive feedback loop that happens that actually eventually trans transfers into true compassion. It's kind of like if you're really unhappy and you force yourself to smile and you just keep on forcing yourself to smile, you will become more happy. It's that feedback loop, that physical feedback loop. So it takes practice, just like putting in a central line or you know, putting, putting in a chest tube, it takes practice. And if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So, I want to get this part right. Learning to be compassionate helps us develop resilience in the chaotic environments that we work in. It's not... It's not simply part of our nature, and we shouldn't take it for granted. Because when you act compassionately, it has profound meaning. One of the big reasons why I had that recording of Barbara Tatum is because she received the compassionate care that she receives in her treatment. We can find compassion in the emergency department, on our, in, our, in our crazy environment that we work in. I urge you to find your compassion, cultivate it, use it, and when you see the power that compassion has for your patients, for your colleagues, I never even got to that part of it, for your colleagues and for you, you'll use compassion at every opportunity that you have. Thank you very much for your attention and may the force of compassion be with you. <laughs>